Objective 2. Use the general addition rule. What happens when you need to compute the probability of two events that are not disjoint, meaning that they have something in common? Suppose we are randomly selecting chips labeled 0 through 9 from a bag. We're going to let E represent the event choose an odd number, and then we're going to let F represent the event choose a number less than or equal to 4. Now, because the event E equals 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, which are the odd numbers, and event F is going to be the numbers that's less than or equal to 4, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, they have the outcomes 1 and 3 in common. So we can see that 1 and 3 is in common for both sets A, E, and F. So the overlapping region is E and F here. And the shaded regions represent E or F. Now, we can compute the probability of E or F directly by counting because each outcome is equally likely. There are 8 outcomes in E or F and 10 outcomes in the sample space. So if we take a look here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay? And we can see that there's a 10 outcomes from the additional numbers that we have in the sample space. So the probability of E or F would be the following. We would say that, okay, well, again, the numbers that's in the set of E or F are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And again, we're dividing it by the total, the number in the sample space, which is 10, which would then give us 4 over 5. So, and again, if we wanted to turn it into a decimal, we can do that by taking 4 and then dividing that by 5, which gives us a decimal equivalent of 0 0.80. Okay, now notice that using the addition rule for disjoint events to find the probability of E or F would be incorrect. Because if we take a look at this figure, and I'm gonna add, I'm gonna put another uh, figure in here so that we can take a look at this here to our left here. Okay, I want you to notice that when we look at the formula, the probability of event E or F, when we separate it in this form, the probability of event E plus the probability of event F. Well, look at all the numbers that we have in event E. Okay, if we take a look at all the numbers we have in event E, well, we have one, two, three. And then we have the 1 and 3, which gives us 5. So that's 5 out of the 10. Okay, and then when we look at the event F, we have 1, 2, 3, and it also includes the 1 and 3. So that means that's going to be 5 over 10, which gives us 1. Okay, now when we look at this, we're repeating 1 and 3 twice, and we can't do that, okay, because of the fact that they have 1 and 3 in common, so we need to be careful of that. Now this implies that the chips labeled 6 and 8 will never be selected because it's outside of those two events, which contradicts our assumption that all the outcomes are equally likely. Now our result is incorrect because we counted the outcomes of 1 and 3 twice. Okay, once for the event E and once for the event F. Now, to avoid this double counting, we must subtract the probability corresponding to the overlapping region E and F. That is, we must subtract the probability of E and F, meaning that they, what do they have in common? They have two values that are in common out of the 10 from the result. So that means we would say, okay, the probability of event E or F Okay, so the probability of event E or F. So we're going to take the probability of event E, which are five numbers. One, two, three, four, five. So we still have five over the number in the sample space of ten. Okay, and then we're going to have the probability of event F, which has also five numbers. One, two, three, four, five. So we have 5 over 10. But now what we want to do is we want to subtract 
okay, we want to subtract what they have in common. So if you notice that we want to subtract the probability of E and F. And the probability of E and F they have are 1 and 3. And how many do they have in common? Well, that's 2 out of the number in the sample space. So if we take 5 plus 5, which is 10, and subtract 2, we get 8 over 10, which is equal to 4 fifths. And therefore, we get the same probability that we got in that first part, which means that our probability is going to be approximately 0 0.80. So this probability four-fifths agrees with the result that we found by counting up here. And so the following rule generalizes this result. Whenever we have numbers in a set that are in common. So the general addition rule is what we call it. For any two events E and F, we would say that the probability of event E or the probability of event F is equal to the probability of event E plus the probability of event F minus the probability of event E and F, and meaning that they have something in common, or is that everything is included. Now let's take a look at an example here, okay? Now example in counting probabilities for events that are not disjoint, okay? So let's take a look at our previous example with when we dealt with cards, okay? So I'm gonna move this over just a little bit, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring back the cards so that we can see what that looks like. Okay, so the example says computing probabilities for events that are not disjoint. Now suppose a single card is selected from a standard deck of 52 cards. And we're going to compute the probability of event E, which is equal to drawing a king, or event F, which is equal to drawing a diamond. Okay, now the approach, now the events are not disjoint because the outcome is the king of diamonds is in both events. So we have to use the general addition rule, which is the probability of E or F, which is equal to the probability of event E, plus the probability of event E, sorry, that should be F, F, okay, minus the probability of event E and F. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Okay, we want to look for the probability of a king or a diamond. So, if we take a look at our deck of cards, the probability of drawing a king, okay, we have four kings. One, two, three, four, and I'm highlighting them in yellow. So we have four divided by 52. Okay, now the next thing is, is that now I want to find out what is the probability of selecting a diamond. Okay, so how many diamonds do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So we have thirteen over fifty-two. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to subtract what they have in common because it's included twice. And if you look here, we have the probability of the king of diamonds. So we see here that it's listed twice in our count. So what does that mean? That means that we need to subtract that amount. That means we need to subtract one of those. Okay, so in order to subtract that, we know that we have our, again, one over 52. So 4 plus 13 is 17. Minus 1 gives us 16. Okay, and if we take each number and divide it by 4, then we get the following fraction. We get 4 over 13. So let's go ahead and then find out what 4 over 13 is in our calculator. Well, 4 divided by 13 gives us a decimal of 0 0.308 rounded to three decimal places. So 0 0.308, okay? So again, we need to subtract what they have in common. So we cannot count the king of diamonds twice. Now, we also can deal with contingency tables. So consider the data shown in a table which represents the marital status of males and females 
15 years and older in the United States in 2016. So over to our left, we see that marital, marital status. And so we have the rows, never married, married, widowed, and divorced. And then over here, we have the columns, which is gender. We have males in millions and females in millions. Now, what we want to do for the contingency table is to find the totals. So if we want to find the total of each row, we would add the number of males that are never married and the number of females that are never married. So 44.1 plus 39.0 gives us 83.1. And so on. For Mary, we take 66.7 plus 67.5, which gives us a total of 134.2. And do the same thing for the rows for the widowed and divorced. And the same thing for the columns, right? For the, for the males column, we add up all those values to get 125.0. And then over here, adding the totals for the females is going to give us a total of 132.7. Now again, the table is called a contingency table or two-way table because it relates to the two categories of data. We said the row is the marital status, the column variable is gender, and then each box inside a table is called a cell. So, for example, the cell corresponding to married individuals who are male is in the second row, first column. And each cell contains the frequency of the category. And if you look here, there were 66.7 million married males in the United States in 2016. Put in another way, in the United States in 2016, there were 66.7 million individuals who were male and married. Now, we're going to use, using the addition rule with the contingency table, we're going to use the data in the table above to answer parts A through D. So the approach is to add the entries in each row and column to get the total number of people in each category, which we've already done. Now for part A, it says, determine the probability that a randomly selected U.S. resident 15 years and older is male. And we're going to use the addition rule for disjoint events because a male cannot simultaneously be married and divorced. So, for example, so if E and, J, if e and F are disjoint, meaning mutually exclusive events, then we would say the probability of event E or F is equal to the probability of event E plus the probability of event F. And if there are more events, then we would add those events in that probability. Now, for this question that we have here, it says there are 125 million males, which is the total here, and 132.7 million females, U.S. residents, that are 15 years or older. Now, we want to find the probability, okay, in our example, that it is randomly selected that the U.S. resident is 15 years and older is male. So we want to know how many are male. So we saw here that our total was 125. So we have 125 to find the probability of the males. Okay, then we want to divide that by the number of outcomes in the entire table, meaning that how many are in the table total. Well, the table total is 257.7. So if we take 125 and divide it by 257.7, then we would get the decimal equivalent of 0 0.485. Okay, next, in Part B, it says, determine the probability that a randomly selected U.S. resident 15 years and older is widowed. So we're looking for when the resident is 15 years older is widowed. Okay, so to determine the probability using using the addition rule for disjoint events, since a widowed individual cannot be male and female simultaneously, if E and F are disjoint or mutually exclusive events, then we would use the following formula. Okay, now what do we know? Well, let's go back up here, okay, and let's see how many in our total is widowed. Okay, well, there are 14.9 million U.S. residents, 15 or older, who are widowed, okay? So if we take a look up here, we can see that when we add the, the row column, we get 14.9.
And we know that there are 257.7 million U.S. residents that are 15 years and older. So the probability that a randomly selected U.S. resident 15 years and older than his widow, the probability of widow, is taken at 14.9. And then we're going to divide it by the table total, which is 257.7, which gives us a decimal equivalent of 0 0.058. Okay, next, it says to determine the probability that a randomly selected U.S. resident 15 years and older is widowed or divorced. So we're looking for a randomly selected individual that is 15 years and older is widowed and divorced. So again, the approach is to use the addition rule for disjoint events. So to find the probability that that is widowed or divorced, well, we need to take the, ma the value of the probability of widowed, which we know is 14.9, okay, plus the probability that the individual is divorced. So let's go back up and take a look in the table, okay? What is the probability that the individual is divorced. Well, we know that that, that amount for the row total is 25.5. So that means we have 25.5, and each of those are gonna be divided by the table total. So if we take 14.9 and divide it by 257.7, we add those together, the numerators, we get 40.4 divided by 257.7, okay, which equals 0 0.157. So the probability that the resident, 15 years or older, is widowed or divorced is 0 0.157. Okay, last question, it says, determine the probability that a randomly selected U.S. resident, 15 years and older, is male or widowed. Okay, so we're looking for the randomly selected individual that is male or widowed. Okay. Now, we're going to have to use the general rule because gender and marital status are not disjoint. Okay, so that means we're looking for the formula that the probability of E or F is equal to the probability of event E plus the probability of event F. Okay, let me make sure we change that here. Minus the probability of event E and F. So we're looking for the probability of male. Okay, now remember the probability of male okay, was given earlier. So we know that the probability of male is 125 divided by the table total of 257.7. Okay, and we also know the probability of widowed was 14.9 divided by 257.7. Okay, now we need to take a look at the probability, we have to subtract the probability of a male that is male and widowed. Okay, so how do we get that? Well, we need to look over here up in our table. Okay, so what is the probability that is male and widowed? So if we come down here, we're going to look at the intersection. So we have the probability that's male and the probability that is widowed. Okay, what that means here is that this number, this value, is going to be in twice. That means we added it in this total and we added it in that total as well. Okay, and we need to subtract that. So therefore, we need to subtract that minus 3.5. Okay. And then we're dividing it by the table total. So if we take 125 and add 14.9 and subtract 3.5, we get 136.4. And 136.4 divided by 257.7 gives us a probability of 0 0.529.